panel we've put together. And we also have a, a really amazing Ocean Startup founder uh, who's going to talk to you a little bit about what she's doing and, and her company is doing. Um, and welcome to the Ocean Solutions Exchange series presented by the Ocean Startup Project. As I said, we've got a great panel, so I don't want to uh, take up too much time talking and 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 distracting from this uh, incredible group of people we've gathered to talk to you about naval and defense today. So I'm just going to jump right in and talk a little bit about the project, the Ocean Startup Project, that is. And, uh, and then we'll jump into uh, a conversation with Sue, or Sue will give us a brief presentation, and then uh, we will uh, get right to the panelists. So uh, the Ocean Startup Project is a, a partnership between Creative Destruction Lab, Genesis, Innovacore, New Brunswick Innovation Foundation, PEI BioAlliance, Springboard Atlantic, Canada's Ocean Supercluster, and ACOA. And the vision of this project is to make Canada the best place in the world to start and grow an ocean company. There's an intense amount of momentum in Canada's ocean economy currently. And we think through collaboration, the existing wealth of experience in this country and a focus on the innovation mindset, we can achieve that vision here. So this project has been in existence for uh, one year and we have several early stage venture ventures that are that we've funded that are starting to see some real results to accelerate that growth uh, of the ocean startup sector here in Canada and to build on the momentum this year the ocean startup project is going to give away 1.4 million dollars to very early stage ocean tech companies applications will open in March and if you are a winner you will receive money but to us, more importantly, we think you'll you'll receive mentorship from some very experienced ocean entrepreneurs, continuous assistance from our executive in residence, Eric Siegel, who is just fantastic, and ocean-specific programming. So applications open in late March. We have three streams for that. We have an idea stream. This is very, very early stage growth stream, which is still early, early stage, but a little bit further beyond uh, the growth stream. And then we have Ocean Shot, which is that great big idea that could solve some incredible uh, problems on the ocean. And, and we're looking for that big idea to come forward on that. So folks, also this year, we have our second cohort of lab to market oceans happening and applications for that are actually open right now. So take a look at our website. We also have our second cohort of CDL oceans, which focuses on massively scalable startup companies. Um, and, and folks, really, we just want to stay connected with you. So please follow us. We've got a lot of different things coming out this year. We've got a lot of programming that could potentially help an early stage venture. And, uh, and, and we want to be here to, to support you as you start your entrepreneurial journey. So I'm going to take down my screen and I want to introduce uh, Sue Malloy. Uh, Sue is the founder of Glass Ocean Electric. Glass Ocean is a system integrator for electric commercial vessels. So Sue, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, Sue is one of our ocean startup companies that we have funded, and we are thrilled to have Sue as part of the Ocean Startup Project. So Sue, over to you for a, a quick chat about your company. Thank you very much, Don. Much appreciated. Uh, so I've only got three minutes. I'll go fairly quickly. This is a vessel that we converted this summer from diesel to electric. And you'll notice it's a fairly heavy duty fishing boat. So a lot of the electric vessels to this point have been uh, either ships or they're in the recreation sector. So we're starting to tackle that in between sector, commercial heavy duty um, boats that require, are required to meet um, uh, regulations uh, from Transport Canada and, and Coast Guard. So I, I decided, hold on, <laughs> next slide. Is that working? You're probably seeing the wrong one. Doesn't matter. So this is a picture of our battery. Um, the battery is, uh, is DMV certified. There are not a lot of those right now. Some of the companies that uh, have had DMV certification in the past have lost that certification due to fires. Um, this company has maintained it and has met all of the recent rules, which we believe are going to impact uh, 
the ability for a bunch of the electric batteries that are out there for the marine sector to, to continue as they are because the DMV has just increased uh, the level of, of rules for these batteries. Um, the next slide is talking or is showing a hydrophone that we deployed. So what we did in our project is we converted the vessel and we also measured emissions, both underwater noise emissions and uh, engine emissions. And we deployed a hydrophone for quite a few months of work. We had um, operations under diesel and we had operations under electric and we were able to compare the noise. And then we measured the emissions from the vessel. So we've got some really great information from this project and it's helping us to build our, our market plan going forward. Um, we we built, built power curves off of all of the vessels using shaft power. We have strain gauges in the shaft and we compared the uh, power uh, under diesel with the power under electric. For this boat, the purpose uh, of the electric installation was to take over all of the low speed operations. So uh, that meant that we only wanted our motor to go up to about eight, nine knots. We didn't need to go above that. So we have 135 kilowatt uh, motor in there. So here, the uh, this top speed goes up to 12. And you can see on this particular vessel that we really start to take off and uh, the power goes up quite high once you get uh, past 12 knots. When we look at the electric one, we only go up as far as 50 kilowatts. But you can see when you actually compare them side by side or on top of each other, that we can get exactly the same power and speeds with the electric motor that we can get with the diesel. So there's no loss of, uh, of power, no loss of uh, performance. Possibilities for the defense sector. We have low noise at lower speeds, so lower cavitation as well. So we get quite a lot of noise. We have the data now to prove it. High torque, it's good for towed arrays, passive acoustic monitoring, reduced detection, lots of things that I haven't even thought of. I'm sure you guys would know more about. Lower uh, vibrations, reduced crew fatigue. And that's an important one. The uh, fatigue you get from vibrations is significant. Future of our company, we're looking at tourism, fishing, aquaculture, and we're also interested in the defense sector. We've been talking with some companies about providing our boat as platform for uh, some of these technologies. We're looking at international and national markets. We've been in discussion with groups uh, out of Costa Rica and other countries in the Caribbean. Um, we're working with international governments to drive the change that we need. So the agencies to develop the markets in line with the emissions target reductions. Uh, we're working uh, right now on, on our first round investment, and we're also interested in ITBs, if anybody has uh, any interest on the, this group here. And we're also looking at scaling our technology. We have um, quite a bunch of gr groups that are interested in seeing if we can put our technology on uh, larger vessels. And because we focus on the commercial rather than the recreational market, we're in good place for that. Right. And that's it. <laughs> A little bit too long. Sorry, Don. No, oh, that was excellent. Excellent. So you can stop sharing that screen if you would. And uh, uh, thank you. So uh, just what you're doing is is so impressive. And uh, and when you're working with large vessels, it is capital intensive and really, really difficult. There's a lot of things that can happen and go wrong. And so uh, I admire what you're doing. Uh, folks, before I introduce our moderator, during the networking portion of today's event, you'll have the opportunity to probably uh, connect directly with the speakers and panelists you see here today. So after the panel discussion, we will open the breakout rooms and I'll give you a few more in instructions at that time. So I want to welcome in Toby Stapleton, who is our moderator today. Uh, Toby, before I read off his bio, I'll just say Toby is one of the great guys in the ocean sector to deal with uh, tons of knowledge. He's been a great contributor to our project, and we just feel lucky to have him involved in today's, uh, in today's panel discussion. So Toby is the co-founder and managing director of the Blue Innovation Symposium, the largest blue technology conference in New England. He has over 20 years of experience in helping companies commercialize technology and find new markets and currently serves as the vice president of the Marine and Oceanographic Technology Network, editorial board of, I think that's, you sit on the editorial board of Ocean News and Technology Magazine and acts as a mentor to several blue technology accelerators. So welcome, Toby. I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce this incredible panel and uh, really, really appreciate you doing this for us. Thanks, Don. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And uh, uh, hello, everyone. As uh, Don mentioned, I'll be serving as the moderator or MC for today's virtual dialogue session. And But I want to start off by thanking Don and Eric uh, for 
um, from the Ocean Startup Project, but organizing this session, particularly because in the United States and Canada, the defense sector, driven mostly by our navies, is not only an important market uh, for marine tech companies, but for many of those companies, it is the market for the vehicles, sensors, and systems being developed, sometimes with the help of government funding and sometimes with support uh, from university researchers uh, by established industry and startups alike. And in this sector, there are big challenges, right? From the challenge of get, how to get those new technologies out of the lab and into the hands of the warfighter as quickly as possible to the geopolitical. For instance, looking at the Arctic alone, and, and thanks to Don for forwarding a recent article uh, in Maritime Executive about how Russia has been conducting experimental winter navigation in the eastern part of the Arctic route. So for the first time this month, we have a large capacity cargo vessel transiting the route, which traditionally, as many of you know, uh, transit navigation along that route usually ends in November and only resumes again in July. So to me, this brings to the forefront the host of issues that we tend to associate with the Arctic sovereignty, navigation, safety, including search and rescue, and of course, defense. So these are just two very small examples of the complexity within this arena that we're gonna to try to address today. Um, so how are we gonna attack this? Uh, we, we're, uh, we're doing it with an, uh, an incredible panel. We not only have a diversity of organizations represented from government, the private sector and research universities, but collectively this panel represents decades of experience in helping to develop and deliver systems used in defense and naval applications. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start the panel off with me asking the panelists to provide a brief introduction. Once we are finished with the introductions, we're gonna ask them to describe the big challenges and opportunities that they see in this sector. Following the panel, we'll have approximately 10 minutes of uh, audience Q&A. If you have a question, please use the chat function, which uh, looks like a lot of you have been using to introduce yourselves. Uh, and um, we have an added bonus, as Don mentioned, so or as they say, but wait, there's more. Each of the panelists has agreed to stick around uh, and participate in the interactive networking session uh, and share their insights learned over a career. So I think Don is gonna provide more information about how, uh, that later after we're done with the panel. Uh, so with that, let's get started. Uh, the first panelist that I'd like to introduce is Michael Brassauer, the co-chair of the NATO Maritime Unmanned Systems Innovation Advisory Board. Michael. Well, uh, good evening, you guys hear me okay? Can you just give me a thumbs up my internet uh, from Bahrain? Um, where I'm the uh, death door of a journey of about uh, ships out here in Bahrain. Uh, uh, before, before that, I worked at the U.S. mission to NATO and uh, was part of a, a really exciting project called the Maritime Unmanned Systems Initiative, which started with 12 nations and has since grown to 17. And it will soon grow to 18 with the addition of another nation here shortly. And that project was basically focused on the, uh, the vertical integration of uh, unmanned systems above, on, and below the water. And then the horizontal integration of um, unmanned systems across the allies. Uh, I've been in the Navy now about 23, 24 years. I've sailed all the ships. Uh, I've been captain of two ships and I grew up on an island. So I, I love the ocean. Uh, this is very personal for me and I'm really excited to talk to you uh, today. Great, great. Thanks, Michael. Our next panelist uh, that I'd like to introduce is Dr. May Sito, Associate Professor and Irvine Chair in Marine Engineering and Autonomous Systems at Dalhousie University. Dr. Sito. Thank you, Toby. So um, I've worked in industry, government, and academia on unmanned systems. So I guess it's become my career. I'm an expat from the West Coast. Um, so after my PhD, I did an NSERC Industrial Postdoctoral Fellow at IAC Limited. They're one of the uh, OEMs for the they are the OEM for the Arctic and Explorer and other naval UUVs. Uh, after that, I spent 15 years at Defense R&D Canada. So DRDC is an agency of the Department of National Defense in Canada. 
and I worked in ship and submarine acoustic signatures. So measuring, characterizing, and mitigating acoustic signatures. Um, I also spent, actually, I spent the bulk of my time working on unmanned systems uh, at DRDC for mine countermeasures, anti-submarine warfare, and intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. Uh, there I was active on NATO and TTCP defense groups with my peers from the US, UK, and Australia. Uh, my area of research was robotic autonomy, so making the, giving the unmanned systems capabilities to make decisions, replan their missions, optimize what they're doing. Uh, recently, we've also added learning, vision, in situ processing of sensors. So that's what I did at DRDC. And then about three years ago, I uh, took a full-time job at Dalhousie University. So our intelligence systems lab has about 12 people. Uh, so I'm an associate professor there in the Faculty of Engineering cross-appointed to computer science. And as uh, Toby said, I'm the Irving Shipbuilding Research Chair in Marine Engineering and Autonomous Systems. So I continue my work in robotic autonomy. Uh, we're involved with multiple defense partners through the DND Ideas Program and ISAID as well. Uh, we've also, we're also working with DRDC and other defense contractors through the NSERC Alliance Program. Occasionally, I'm directly contacted, contracted by OEMs to develop new methods and tools for their unmanned systems. So I'm still contributing to NATO groups. Um, and at the moment, I'm also still a DRDC contractor uh, working on an unmanned system autonomy framework. And I'm also directly contra contracted by the Department of National Defense to work on a, um, an advanced development model of a multi-domain control system for unmanned systems. So that's me, Toby. Great, thanks, May. Um, all right, uh, next up, we have John Waterson, uh, Program Manager from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, Ocean of Things. John? Thanks, Toby. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, John Waterston here. I've been a Program Manager at DARPA now for four years, which means I'm on my way out. We're one of those weird organizations where in the government where they hire you and fire you as part of your... Um, conditions for joining that keeps us fresh. And I think that's the difference about uh, life at DARPA. We move fast and we take risks and we fail as much as we succeed. And for those who don't know DARPA, we see ourselves as the venture capital arm in some ways of the DOD, right? We have $3 billion spread across a hundred people like me. And, um, if you have a good idea, come talk to us and we'll uh, see, see where it fits into our portfolio, right? And we're trying to bring about kind of revolutionary ideas. And, you know, we were spun out 60 years ago by President Eisenhower when the Russians launched Sputnik. And we, we needed to have a response. And President Eisenhower said he never wanted to be surprised again in what we're doing. So, um, I work in the strategic technology office where we're putting those lightning bolts and all those drawings. Uh, and we're building those architectures, connecting things and putting them together. We have a kind of a vision on how to do that and think today that it's not like a puzzle and a standard as much as a mosaic. And we have to figure out how to let computers talk to each other, automate that process and accelerate the deployment and scale and uh, speed at which we are putting autonomous platforms into the environment. And that, that's what's gonna change the game more so than building a new uh, platform, but figuring out how to take what we have and put it to better use. And uh, look forward to the discussion today and uh, engaging with everyone afterwards. Great, thanks, John. Um, and uh, uh, rounding out the panel, we have Jeff Smith, who is the Chief Scientist, Unmanned Undersea Vehicle Systems, BAE Systems. Jeff? Thanks, Toby. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Jeff Smith, uh, Unmanned Undersea Vehicle Guy. Um, I've got about uh, 28 years in uh, uh, mostly uh, global defense industry. Uh, I spent about half of that with uh, General Dynamics. I spent seven years with Bluefin Robotics, where I exited as the chief operating officer and uh, started a company called Riptide Autonomous Solutions, uh, focused on small, uh, primarily man portable UEVs. Um, took that uh, in four years and sold it to uh, BAE Systems, uh, where we're now part of that, uh, of that company. And I'm a chief, uh, as Toby said, chief scientist now for UEVs for uh, BAE. 
So I look forward to, to participating in today's discussions. Great, thanks, Jeff. And thanks to the panel for um, agreeing to participate today. So we're gonna jump in um, with, by asking, you know, to tackle this big topic by asking a big question of each of the panelists, which is where, where do you see, or what do you see as the big challenges and opportunities? And we're gonna start with Michael. So Michael, take it away or kick us off. Okay, well, thank you, Toby. And uh, really, again, honored to be on this uh, esteemed panel. Uh, and I see one of my fellow uh, Innovation Advisory Board members as a, as a guest, uh, Julie Angus, who's, a, of course, a rock star in Canada. So good to see you, Julie. Um, I, I, I wanted to talk about uh, a piece I wrote with a, a colleague of mine from uh, Estonia. Estonia, as you know, is a digital nation. And we were looking at some of the mega trends, uh, you know, uh, that affecting us all, you know, climate change, population growth and migration. Uh, global insecurity, um, scarcity of resources. And we kind of saw this, this perfect storm gathering. And we thought uh, rather than admire the problem, why don't we propose a, a kind of interesting solution or, uh, and you guys have probably heard about the digital ocean as an opportunity uh, to, to, to um, really address some of those challenges that I highlighted. Um, and, you know, John's probably going to talk about the ocean of things. Uh, you know, we, we see this as an internet of things for the ocean with the things being drones, primarily driven, you know, by wind, wave, and solar, connecting those into a, in, in a, in a really um, uh, exciting way where you start to build the data necessary to get predictive in nature. And you can, you can imagine the benefits uh, from my, my side out here. Uh, you know, you've got issues of, uh, you know, arms moving at sea. You've got, uh, uh, you know, weapon, uh, you know, you've got illegal fishing, all these sort of things that could be addressed with, uh, with a digital ocean. I see a bunch of uh, uh, challenges. Um, to actually making the digital ocean a reality. And I mean, unfortunately, um, one of them is our own bureaucracies, right? Uh, we, we don't, sometimes we're our worst enemies. And I say this as a member of the bureaucracy and often uh, frustrated. I'm not an entrepreneur like you, I'm an intrapreneur. I like to get things done quickly. We were able to do some really exciting things at NATO uh, but again, it's an uphill battle uh, fighting our various bureaucracies. Um, I also think there's a challenge of a sense of urgency. Um, I think the climate issue is real uh, and we need to move fast to address it. Um, I also see uh, some additional challenges with respect to budgets. You know, we're in the midst of a global pandemic and I see downward pressure on defense budgets and other budgets. So it actually, in many ways, makes the case for unmanned solutions, right? Uh, it's a lot, you can't throw $1.8 billion warships uh, at the problem. The ocean is massive and uh, there's simply the math doesn't work. So that's a, that's a challenge that might work out in the, in the favor of unmanned systems. And then um, kind of the elephant in the room from a security perspective is China. Um, you know about the uh, um, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, you also uh, have about the digital Silk Road that they're, they're building. And you can certainly see that crossing over to the maritime space. They're, gr they're growing their Navy at an alarming rate. So those are the kind of big challenges, bureaucracy, budget and um, uh, China. It offers a huge amount of uh, opportunities. I think there's an opportunity for NATO to lead in, in this space and, and, and create an, a digital ocean. I mean, who else would you trust uh, with that sort of amount of data and, and, and the ability to keep our um, sea lines of communication open? Uh, NATO has a 70 year history of, uh, you know, of working together to prevent war and to keep our, our uh, democracies safe. Um, there's also a, a potentially 
huge opportunity for to turbocharge the blue economy with the creation of the digital ocean. I mean, some estimates uh, as much as $3 trillion by the year 2030. This could really ignite um, that creation of capital, which only enhances um, our ability to secure, um, not only secure the seas, but to uh, provide security for our nation. And then, I would just like to, to, to close with there's an opportunity uh, with the creation of a digital ocean to address so many different issues. As I mentioned, um, illegal fishing, uh, um, climate, if you're able to do it in a sustainable uh, and uh, secure way, you can certainly uh, harness the energies of the, uh, the ocean, be it wind or wave or um, the sun. So just a, a lot of opportunities here, and I, I, I'm really excited about the potential of the creation of the digital ocean. That's all I have, Toby. That's great, Michael. What a great way to start us off. Um, so next, uh, I'm gonna turn things over to uh, Dr. Sito, May. Thanks, Toby. So I wanna start by, um, by articulating some of the trends that I've seen that are driving what's going on. One of them is this uh, entity they call artificial intelligence. I don't actually like that word, but um, I, I take it to mean machine learning, vision, automation, uh, optimization, mission replanning as far as autonomous systems are concerned. So that's one trend. Another trend is computing power. So it's getting cheaper and much, much smaller. And what that means is um, you can put a sensor and a processor and network it to just about anything else very easily and very cheaply. And in the process, you can actually create some really neat products with uh, capabilities that weren't there before. And then we've got this promise of quantum computing a few horizons away to look forward to. Great, so networking these systems, uh, you can share your data, share your situational awareness and have all your different systems unmanned or, or stationary collaborate with one, uh, with one another. And robotics is a big example of that. Uh, another trend is this tendency towards software defined. So just in my lab, we've got software defined radios, modems, sensors, communication systems, and that increases their flexibility in what they can do. And again, what you can integrate to and uh, like the uh, networks or the machine learning. Another big trend is the big data analytics. Um, so we've got lots and lots of data, that's legacy data, but given the ease with which we can um, log and, and measure sensors on just about any device, we've got more data than we can manage. How do we make use of that in the short term? You can't realistically have people going through these reams of data and giving you timely information, especially if situational awareness is what you're concerned with. So therein lies some of the challenges. So these are all, they're not new technologies necessarily. They're technologies that are being put together in a different way. So mastery, and insight into these technologies uh, as an entrepreneur, I would think would uh, be something you would consider. And how, and I echo Michael Brasier's um, sentiment on this, how can they best be exploited to provide new naval capabilities? We've got lots of technology, how do we best use it? Um, and another, another sticking point, especially for those of us who work in the naval uh, space is security of these systems. So it's great that you can measure everything, you can uh, log it at very high data rates, you can share it, but how do we ensure that they're secure? And if you've got multiple systems collaborating with one another, how do we give them secure communications for that? And uh, that's stuff that we've been working on for a while, and I'm not going to say I have any answers necessarily towards that. So another challenge, which I kind of alluded to earlier, is how are you gonna manage this reams and reams of data that is being collected? So it's easy to generate, but you can't realistically expect people to be able to analyze it so that you can get um, good answers very quickly. And that's where I think tools like um, learning and in particular unsupervised learning or semi-supervised learning can help. They can help with uh, the, the analysis and the organization of the data and divining trends out of it that you would not necessarily be looking for. So one project that we're working on with um, our defense contractors is looking at the naval information space. 
So you've got lots of sensors out there if you're on a warship uh, to give you situational awareness of things, but how do you reduce that down to something that's usable fairly quickly? Right. And for those of you who, who may be new as entrepreneurs to learning, to machine learning, uh, there are more online courses out there than ever has been. These courses are not going to make you an expert. They're going to give you enough knowledge um, to perhaps manage and to, to start the conversation on that. So that's something that I think we should be looking at a little more seriously. As well, uh, in, in terms of partners, um, there's lots of agencies out there that um, that can that you can partner with. So if you've got a neat gizmo that you think could benefit from interfacing with some learning, uh, universities, agencies, usually the labor there is, uh, is not very expensive, nor is their access to high powered GPUs. So that's um, another, that's an opportunity that you can keep in mind. Right, and the defense agencies are now reaching out openly beyond their usual venues for um, ideas and, uh, and, your, and your brilliant thoughts on what you could apply to make their job a little bit easier. That's all I've got, Toby. That's a lot. Thanks, May. Yeah, and, and the challenge uh, also there is the normalization of the, the, inf the data that's coming in. So taking quantitative, taking imaging, and uh, putting it together in a way that you're able to not only analyze, but to do things like dashboarding. So great, mm -hmm. um, great themes there. And, and, um, and, so, and a great lead in uh, to our next uh, panelist, uh, John Waterson from DARPA. John, take it away. Yeah, so there's so much of what I want to echo from uh, from Michael and May that, that 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 I'm doing day in and day out across my various programs. Some of the things I want to convey to this audience here is really the trend that that I see that we we need to take advantage of in naval and defense is to capitalize on commercial investments. Mm -hmm. And so um, May brought up. Um, Starlink in our discussion uh, earlier this week as we were preparing for this panel and, uh, you know, and this idea that we'll have ubiquitous communications, what are you using? You know, I'm using Iridium today in a lot of my platforms, but I'm not investing in future comms because people like Elon Musk are investing so much and we're just going to ride that. And we've already started to ride that in the idea of microprocessors and their low power, high compute states, the battery technology that we use today. So we need to, to think into all those lanes of commercial investment that go into things like our cell phones, and that includes sensors. And so Ocean of Things, which you, you heard mentioned here, is really taking a three-year-old cell phone, putting it in a waterproof enclosure, taking off the display, and uh, trying to derive and extract information from the ocean. So with but one cell phone isn't valuable. The value of uh, these future sensors are in the network, are in the distributed nature. So this idea of distributed uh, networks of sensors is, is the other major trend that I, I wanna capitalize on because that allows us to fill in the gaps between uh, the man platforms that we have today. There's never going to be any better sensor than we can put in the environment than a trained um, captain and their ship and the, their, their weapons and sensors there. But the problem is, is we don't have 100,000 vessels, right? We, we need to be able to, the ocean is huge and uh, we need to be able to fill in those gaps in the ocean so that we have awareness and it's not just for military awareness, that same fundamental awareness for environmental purposes, for agriculture or aquaculture purposes. So the commercial entities and academic entities all can kind of create that same data. So that implies these kind of next set of challenges where I see is, is to getting to that scale, to deal with the whatever the 200 million square kilometers of ocean that are out there and um, how do we get to those numbers? And with the budgetary pressures that have mentioned and things like that, we, we can't. So, so DARPA is investing in, can we make $500 disposable sensors, right? Your cell phone for the ocean, because no commercial venture is going to figure out how to sell something just for $500 because we don't have that marketplace yet for people to buy this type of ocean data. So, talking to everyone here as a potential user 
or a collector of this data is really important to me because the more people using and wanting this, the better ecosystem we can build. Um, and then as we bring that data in, we got to trust it and it gets to the handling and analytics that are out there. I'm using all those machine learning things. I think there's a lot of stuff to do, but more people getting familiar with the, the data that's collected and finding it is super important. And I mean, my last challenge is really, I think a larger one in the, um, the defense world is how do we automate all these processes, right? And so as you can deploy them, but now that they're computers, we got to start automating and creating these tools and dealing with them. And so that's always a challenge and thinking about how to do that automation better. And I think we often talk about it as uh, AUVs and autonomous systems uh, just in mo their mobility, but I think I, you should think of their autonomy in their function. And so by taking autonomy to a functional level is a huge value. So when you have all these systems out there, now you can, the, the opportunity is you can find new signals in the multimodal environment. You can sense the ocean in a much higher resolution. You're gonna add edge processing. So you're extracting the right information at the right time from the ocean. And uh, that's gonna allow this convergence of military commercial and academic users, all collecting data and all sharing that data for different uses, but a common purpose. So that's kind of my vision in the way to think about the current trends and uh, state of ocean sensing and utility. Great, thanks, John. And I, I think we're hearing some recurring themes in, in the panel from the panelists and, and certainly as John points out, uh, um, not only do we have opportunities around data, data analytics, but comms, communications and sensors, and, and also supporting technologies like battery and battery power technologies, which are, um, you know, I, I uh, think are, are, uh, is one of the areas that you're particularly going to see some activity in. And uh, I know our next panelist has uh, experience uh, from a, a system side uh, on, on a lot of this. So I'm going to turn things over to Jeff Smith from BAE Systems. So Jeff. Thanks, Toby. So this is a really interesting panel for me in that, um, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with both John and May over the years um, in, in the roles that they've had at DRDC and at DARPA. Um, and, you know, Michael being on the, on the panel really, you know, ultimately represents the end user and the warfighter. And, you know, the challenge that I see in the space is there's, you know, at the end of the day, the military, um, regardless of which one, is a technology user. They need the technology to do what they do and do what they do safely. And the challenge is, for the most part, the military really isn't set up through the acquisition programs to get that technology fast and be able to adopt it really quickly and, and use it. So, even though they have a really high demand for the technology, the, by the time the technology comes through the development programs and gets to the warfighter, it can take years and the technology is sort of obsolete. So the, you know, in working at, there's a lot of programs that are out there um, at the front end where, you know, you can get that s and development dollars to, to bring that technology to the next level and show the military utility of it. But I think the big challenge is really how do you get it from that place into, you know, ultimately into widespread use in the military and, and adopt it and transition it to really tradition, uh, transition it to production, transition it to field use and operational use. And that's, that's I think, where, you know, it, there's a lot of small businesses in the space. I've worked with a lot of them where, you know, we really do have the next greatest thing. And it's just, you get to a certain point and then it's, you know, now what? You know, how do we get it to that next level and get it out there and get it adopted by the end users and, and transition it? And that's where there's sort of a, there's a gap in that transition acquisition timeline that, um, you know, we really need to kind of work through. And I know there's, there's groups and, you know, John's work programs for where he's pushed to transition to, to the uh, operations and that, and that's really the objective. And, and that's the part that tends to, in my opinion, be one of the, the biggest challenges that we have in this, in this space. Thanks, Jeff. And yet the, um, so with that, I'm actually going to use that because I think that's a good way to segue into a discussion uh, and into the, the Q&A portion of this. Because when, when I, to your point exactly, Jeff, you know, when I look at, uh, across the North American landscape in, in blue tech, 
there are ecosystems, so Halifax being one, New England being another, uh, Gulfport, Mississippi, San Diego, Seattle, where you've got blue tech ecosystems growing, startups forming, the Navy is supporting some of that, industry is supporting uh, some of it, uh, but it's, it's very de decentralized. And then never mind uh, what's being developed in Europe. And so, you know, it with, you know, in, in, uh, within our allies. Um, what is it, you know, does the panel have any thoughts about what, it, what it's going to take uh, to bring these ecosystems together and maybe further the development and launching of these technologies, getting the hand, you know, again, not only moving it through uh, R&D into private industry, but into the hands of the warfighters as quickly as possible. Uh, does the panel have any thoughts on that? And I'll, I'll just throw that out as a loosely formed question. Michael. Yeah, yes, uh, you know, first of all, I, I, I agree 100% with the comments you made and, and Jeff, and it's a, it's a frustration that I deal with, uh, you know, out here. I, I know there's some exciting tech. I would love to get my hands on it because I've got pro real, you know, real problems out here. I got battle space to cover between the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, the Northern uh, Arabian Sea and the Arabian Gulf. Um, and, and I need this tech. And, and Jeff highlights the problem from, you know, from within the, the government. I think, and you know, I'm, I have now moved on from NATO, but this is, I, this is, I think, where NATO can and should lead. And you started to see a little bit of that with the Maritime Unmanned Systems Initiative, as mentioned, 18 19 nations working together. Canada's one of those. The US is the lead for this. Estonia is just gonna join. So uh, you've got 19 nations all kind of working together. And actually Julie Angus and I uh, wrote a piece on, um, on a global network of uh, accelerators to help get the tech out, uh, you know, from the early TRLs out into the end users and I think NATO could be a real key um, player stitching that together. Um, just a few thoughts there. I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to the, to the rest of the team if they have any additional thoughts. Great, thanks, Michael. Any of our other panelists? So I kind of think that I agree with that fully. And I think getting um, devices and experimentation going out where it matters is super important. The, the challenge is then is getting the acquisition community working in parallel with that so that they can meet it on the backside, because this is the traditional valley of death that we all talk about. And living that and really pushing for a transition is super challenging. So um, I don't know if it's our, it's the acquisition communities that really need to be supportive of the fleet. And sometimes they're not. And um well, I think the R&D and science agencies are. So um, I, I think it's the fleet needs to, at the same time, they're saying, hey, I'm going to touch this. You're, you got to say, I want this in a year too. And we have to have flexible ways to acquire this. And I think there's some new things coming down the pipe in, in the U.S. with OTAs and the like and some service-based contracts. But they're, they're not the panacea in the timeline. And the timeline is what kills small businesses. And I realized that by moving fast, that's that's what small businesses need for their cash flow purposes, and, that, and that's something that the the larger defense enterprise doesn't realize when you're working with large primes who have the ability to insulate themselves from those kind of cash flow issues. Thanks, John. Je Jeff or May, any thoughts? So, I guess speaking personally, you know, I looked at you know when we started Riptide, we thought we had you know a really good approach to small vehicles, lower costs, doing something that was a little bit different from what the rest of the industry was doing. And we saw you know, a gap basically in the industry that we could fill pretty quickly, but at the same time, we recognized that we had fairly limited resources to do that. So from our perspective, sort of the fastest way to get to where we needed to be was to go the acquisition route and partner with, for instance, you know, BAE in our case. And, you know, I look at, and, um, you know, I look at what BAE has been able to do, and there's a really great Forbes article done a year, uh, year and a half ago, roughly, about their Fast Labs group, which is where we ended up. And they 
you know, I don't want to make this a corporate plug for BAE, but they have a really unique approach in pulling in technologies, working with universities, and sort of working closely with the accelerators out there to, to transition and help transition that to, um, you know, military utility. And that was something that really kind of, you know, hit a chord with us and won us over to sort of pursue that path with them and get to where we are today. Great. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. And I, I want to circle back to that, but, but first, May, uh, any thoughts? Um, it's, I agree with John that procurement's often, often the issue, at least as, as I understand it. I mean, we get the warfighters coming to us saying, I would like this very soon, right? And they have to go through a process uh, like, like any other government to acquire it. And that's usually the, uh, the nail in the coffin, right? This is something that's going to take uh, quite a few years. So there's been a major acquisition that I'm aware of for unmanned systems, and it's probably a decade in the making, right? So how do you get around that? One way around that is through, I think what Jeff calls accelerators, we call them demonstrators. Um, so there are venues to show, showcase your wares uh, to the right audience. Right. And, and there are workshops and panels that the, um, the defense interests will host. So being visible at that end helps because what you really need to get through the system is a champion. You need a champion that says, I want this on my ship within a year's time. Right. So it's, it's waving your hands, I guess, furiously enough, whether it's at an accelerator or a demonstrator event and uh, talking to the right people. I mean, we've, we've got these events in May of, in May and September in Canada and, and several, several startups I know of, um, like, like DefSec is, is a good place to be because the, uh, the clients there in uniform. So they can't be a champion for your product if they don't know that it exists. Right. Yeah, that, and that's interesting, May, because you know, like one of the things that's been impacted by COVID nineteen, obviously, is the ability to do these demonstrations, as you describe. You know, here in the U.S., and the Advanced Naval Technology Exercise Antex has been one of those methods that companies from startup through the big the primes have been able to get stuff in water and demonstrate to not only you know people in uniform, but also to legislators so that they can kind of, you know, take, they, it, it's sort of a holistic approach to getting people excited about the thing that you've developed. Um, yes. My, May. Yeah, so in Canada, it's CanSec in May and DefSec in the uh, early autumn. Right, right. Yeah, so, exactly. And so th this is, you know, may maybe, a, a, um, you know, to John's point about, you know, he was uh, talking about Elon Musk. And, and so one of the things, like six years ago, if you went to a marine technology conference, the first thing people would talk about is that more people have walked on the surface of the moon. And now with all the excitement about, the, about Mars right now, this is you know, kind of coming back that you know, uh, more people have walked on the surface of the moon than have walked on the bottom of the ocean. And, and it highlights you know, sort of the public interest in um, you know, space exploration uh, and, and maybe less attention being paid to our oceans, which is important for not just defense as we're talking about now, but the, the planet's health, as Michael pointed out in his remarks, um, climate change um, and whatever the reasons behind climate change is gonna affect a whole bunch of things, including defense and the way that our navies operate. But one of the things, you know, getting back to John's Elon Musk comment and you know, thinking about some of the startups like Ocean Server, uh, was a company making underwater autonomous vehicles that uh, you know was self-funded, bootstrapped. In 13 years, they you know got to organic growth. They were selling uh, uh, units and finally got acquired by L3. Now L3 Harris. Um, today, the speed at which the large primes are ac acquiring startups and startup technology, and, and Jeff knows this space better than I do, uh, has has really increased. So from 13 years to much uh, quicker between startup and acquisition. And, and that to me is two things driving that. The large companies are innovating through acquisition and there is a, uh, a, a, an immense uh, FOMO, fear of missing out by the primes uh, to not miss out on a new you know, sensor vehicle or whatever technology. To what extent um, are we gonna see these new technologies come out of you know, either the you know, research universities 
uh, private industry or you know government funded DARPA or, or otherwise um, uh, fun programs or or is this really a collective because right now it's a little bit to me it's sort of siloed there's there's things being funded by DARPA that are going to um, see the light of day there's things coming out of universities a little trickier to commercialize uh, and then there's the you know entrepreneurial side of this which I you know there's lots of accelerator programs that are formed up to support blue um, where are we going to see the next generation of, of technology come out of? I, I would suggest the partnership is good. The university's TRL is not high enough to sell something usually, right? And if you had a partner, and, and we've had startups as partners in our labs, they can take it to the rest of the, they can take it the rest of the way, right? It's not the role of the university to get it to TRL eight or nine. The, TR, the university has some neat ideas, they've, they've uh, taken it to TRL five, maybe six, and then you need a partner, you need, somebody who can take it the rest of the way. Great. And, 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 and at a point here, I think we need some imagination too on the government side. There's a huge lack of imagination. I mean, um, you know, let's, let's get past the, let's build a one third version of a ship, a submarine, an aircraft, and and un, and you know take out the human. Let's you know let's have a little bit of imagination, like like John is doing with, you know, the in an ocean of things. Let's let's create. You know, um, I, I think that's that's a real issue uh, within within the government. Great. Thanks, Michael. John or Jeff, any last thoughts before we get into um, audience questions? I think I'm good here. Okay. All right, great. So um, the first question we have is, um, what technology is the Navy interested in leveraging from civilian use and what civilian markets can be leveraged for Navy use? Communications, analytics. I mean, all, all, all these these do. I mean, is, is, it depends on what side of the you know. Are you a hardware company? Are you a software company? And I think the the list is almost everything. And uh, I, I I find that it's it's not so hard to to put it in. You you might have to think the context a little bit and the use case a little different. But there there's many applications across. I mean, it's battery technology, uh, wave, solar panels. Uh, I'm, I'm investing in methane capture. Um, uh, all sorts of stuff that's that's out there already. Uh, we're taking tracking um, loggerhead turtles and using that to to find uh, underwater sonars. Things like this are are, are happening day in and day out. Um, and you just have to say, oh, I guess if 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 you were looking for um, pinnipeds, that's very similar to looking for a pathometer. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Yeah, and to Toby, uh, and one of the points that John touched on earlier, the dual use, with the downward pressure on the budgets, uh, you know, the, the robotics or whatever need to be able to do multiple missions, you know, and work for, you know, the fishery industry one day and you know, find a submarine the, the next day. So I, I just, uh, I think the dual use is, is very important uh, right. because there's, the money is not endless. Right. Jeff, May? I would suggest services are also important. Right? If you don't have to have a factory floor to be making widgets. If you're, if you're good at um, putting data together or, or, or clustering things to find uh, trends, and, and you've got that skill or talent as an entrepreneur, you could easily sell that, that stuff that even I want to outsource. Right. You've got, and, and if you own a piece of kit, so if you owned a really good um, bathymetric sonar, that's great. You can, uh, you can provide that as a service. Right. So Jeff? the, yeah, the, um, you know, on our side, the, you know, the commercial market is really driving smaller, faster, cheaper, right? And and everything 
that you use in the commercial market really is is applicable to pull into um, the products and the systems of systems that really you know are going out there. Um, battery technology is you know is you know everything's moving to electric, and you know we're we're seeing you know some things that are not too far out that look like significant jumps in energy density that I think we all need, and that you know the longer something can run, the more operationally useful it is for the military. It's just, you know, it's one of these things that just keeps, you know, feeding itself as the technology gets better. Right. Yeah. That, and that's a great point, Jeff, because a, a lot of the companies developing tech uh, in this space really look at the Navy first, because that has been where the money has been. Mm -hmm. uh, but moving forward, there's opportunities for, uh, these other industries that are coming online, like in the Northeast, uh, New England, uh, offshore wind is going to uh, drive a lot of development. You know, May mentioned bathymetric surveys. And, and so you're going to have a movement towards utilizing or the utilization of um, autonomous systems and vehicles to do some of that both pre, uh, you know, sort of uh, pre siting of those turbines. And then afterwards, once the turbines are up, they're gonna need somebody to go out, something to go out and monitor them. And so, uh, and then aquaculture and, and seafood are also uh, industries where you're gonna see the use uh, or greater use of technology when, as Jeff pointed out, it becomes smaller, faster and cheaper and easier to deploy because the old model is, as everyone can attest is, you know, that the, the system costs hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, requires, you know, a dozen MIT engineers to, to operate it. And today, uh, sort of Jeff's model with Riptide was, it was smaller, easier to use and, and easily deployable with a minimum amount of training. So, um, so <coughs> um, let me see here in the uh, questions here. Uh, we have one question. I think we've answered this, but uh, how do we better transfer technology from academic researchers to end users? I think we touched on this, but uh, May, is there a silver bullet here or uh, John, Michael, Jeff? Is... Uh, Toby, I actually wanted to, to touch on your last point about um, keep, you know, this, given the product and end user to the end user that's easy to use. I can tell you, I was a captain of a LCS, the littoral combat ship in the United States Navy, which was a minimally manned crew, you know, 8,500 sensors on board, supposed to be fully automated. Uh, but it was, it, it is super complex to operate and these engineers and these, these uh, operators are so, so busy. Um, so I think just the ease of use is very important in the design. Uh, that's really the quickest way to, to um, bridge that gap from academia to the end user. You've got to make something that's easy to use and that really provides value, uh, that the you know, tangible value that the operator needs. And it's not just another uh, distraction that gives you a bunch of false alarms that you were, we're already overwhelmed yeah. with the, the amount of work we have to do. So just a, just a thought there. That that's great. And, and actually we're, we're going to have to wrap up Mike, Michael, I think that's, you know, perfect uh, because uh, researchers and, you know, certainly graduate students or engineering students uh, don't always think about usability when they're building out or working on technology. So that really you know, is where um, an opportunity for private industry to work with those grad students or researchers comes in. And, and there's numerous ways to do that. But unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to first start off by thanking our panel, Dr. Sito, John, Jeff, and Michael for participating in today's uh, discussion. And um, uh, turn things over to Don, who is going to describe how you're going to access uh, the networking session. So stick around, opportunity to network and, and lear learn more from the panel. So thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Toby. It's uh, what a great discussion. And, and it's fun for me to look at all the people who are on here. Like, I, you know, we, we've got Julie Angus, who, who Michael mentioned, and, and she is an absolute superstar. I, I look at some of the other names and startup entrepreneurs that we're, we've got on here. We've got Arnold Furlong from Dartmouth Ocean Technologies. We've got Chidich from Cavaccio. We've got Drew 
McDonald. We've got Jason Gillum from, from Grand River Robotics. Like these are the, the, the next generation uh, coming up and, and really doing amazing things in this sector, but also that dual use sector. So really fun to see a, a lot of people uh, there's also uh, Abjit from uh, Qualities on here, which I, I saw. All of these are people who are related to the project as well. So, so fun to see see uh, them interacting with with this esteemed panel. Uh, just a huge thank you to you, Toby, as moderator, and to our panelists. Uh, just a terrific discussion, and and uh, one that we will make available by a video as well after this. So uh, we'll we'll get that out to everybody and and 